Good afternoon, everyone. It's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Antonia Matinakis, our speaker today for the Covey Lecture Series. Antonia is an assistant professor of marketing uh, here at Brock University in the Faculty of Business. She's also an associate uh, faculty member in the Department of Psychology and also one of our Covey Fellows uh, here at Brock. Uh, Antonia's research is focused on the psychological factors that affect uh, consumer behavior, and she chooses wine as one of her model topics to research. Uh, and um, over the last few years, Tony has traveled around quite a few different areas as a, as a guest professor and a fellow. In, in 2006, she was at the University of Chicago Graduate School of Business. Uh, in 2007, a visiting professor at Vamasat University in Bangkok, in Thailand, and uh, last year she was at Columbia School of Business in Manhattan. Uh, the research that Antonia carries out, she actually does at our second facility, that's part of Covey, at the <coughs> Consumer uh, uh, Perception and Cognition Laboratory just down the hill. And she also carries out research in collaboration uh, with Isabel Lachev, uh, one of the researchers at Vineland Research and Innovation Center. So with that, Antonia, I'll pass it off to you. Thank you. Thanks for the lovely introduction. Um, let me just make sure. All right. OK, thanks to everybody for being here today, coming out in the rain, trekking out here. I see a lot of you are all wet, so I hope that uh, I hope you dry off in a moment and uh, can enjoy the talk. The first thing I'd like to do is ask you, because I know that everybody is here today um, from, you know, some of you are students, some of you are winery owners, um, some of you are um, coming from the LCBO. And I'd just like you to take a moment and think about, from a consumer standpoint, what some choices are that your consumers make. So just take a moment and think about it. And you can, if you're a student, you might actually want to think about this from the perspective of the consumer as well. You can think of, you know, when was the last time I bought a bottle of wine, for example. And so, you know, think about what some of the decisions you had to make, um, you know, as a consumer. Or, you know, again, what some of the decisions your consumers have to make. So just think about that for a second. The last time you bought a bottle of wine or you were in a restaurant and you had, as a consumer, you had to make a decision, okay? So some of the things that you probably thought about are things like this. Tonight, am I going to have red or white? Right? Or on this wine list, which one of these wines look the most appealing to me? So which one am I going to choose from this list? That's a decision that consumers have to make. What price point is reasonable for me as a consumer? Right? So these are things people have to take into consideration. Um, another one is, you know, you, you go into a winery and you sample a, a set of wines, and then, you know, as a, you, you might be the one pouring the wine, and you would ask the consumer, well, which one of these that you sampled today was your favorite, right? Another decision, too, if, if we think about, you know, if you want a, a particular bottle of wine from East Dell, well, living in the Niagara region, you have the choice of whether you actually want to drive out to the winery to purchase that wine and get the winery experience, or you can just go across the street to the LCBO or drive down the street and, and purchase this wine because you know that it's, it's available at the LCBO. So it's all these kinds of decisions that are, are so important to understand um, no matter what area of the industry you're in um, because these kinds of decisions can have a huge impact to your bottom line. And so that's what I'm going to talk about today. Um, as, as Debbie mentioned, um, I'm a psychologist by training, so I'll go into a little bit of more of my background in a moment. But this is the general theoretical framework that I'm going to use to sort of walk you through um, my presentation today. Um, because all of the decisions that I just introduced in, in, in the previous slide fall into one of these three s steps, or the, the sequence of events that a consumer can go through. So for the first one, um, whether you're in a, in, in a retail environment or if you're at a winery or if you're, you're sitting at a restaurant, there's that choice, right? So before the consumer has even taken a sip of the wine, 
this phase is so important to understand, right? Because what I'm going to talk about today are what are some of the incidental factors that could have a huge impact on what a consumer might choose before they've even taken a sip, right? So that's the one, one stage that we're going to focus on today. Then is the next step, which is the consumption experience. So what are some of the incidental um, contextual factors or contextual variables that can influence a person's perception of the actual taste of that wine, right? Because there's all these little things that can make a huge difference to how this wine is, is you know, how it tastes perceptually on the palate um, that you might have not ever thought of could make a big difference. And then finally, the last one, which is actually my favorite part of the whole model, is a person's memory of the experience of either the choice that they made or the context they were in when they were making the choice, or the memory of the experience of the taste of the wine. So why, let, let me just ask you all, why is the memory of the experience, and let's think about this from a marketing standpoint, why is the memory of the experience of each of the, the two prior steps, why is it so important? So think about it from a consumer standpoint, from a marketing standpoint, why is that so, why would you want your consumers to have a very memorable, pleasant, um, great memory of the experience of either of those two things? Why is, why is that so important? If we think about that. And what are the incidental variables that influence this? Okay, so why, why is it so important? From a marketing standpoint, that's the thing, that's, oh, Brian, do you want to take a guess? I was going to say it sets the tone for a repeat purchase. Yes, it sets the tone for a repeat purchase. Whether that person wants to go back and have one of these same experiences, that's all they rely on, right? Their memory, what's in their memory? And, and, and I'm going to talk about some of the things that can even influence that person's memory, right? And another thing is word of mouth, right? Somebody says, have you ever been to this winery before? Yes, I've been to this winery before. I had an, a great experience. You should go sometime, right? All the consumer has at that point, they don't have the wine in front of them. They can't give it to their friend to say, taste this wine and go, right? The only thing they're relying on at that point is their memory for the experience of that wine. And so that's such an important part of the consumer decision-making process that we need to, to understand. Okay, so a little bit of background about me. As, as Debbie mentioned, I'm actually a cognitive psychologist by training. So a lot of the theoretical frameworks that I use in my research borrow from cognitive psychology or the field of social cognition. And so what I like to do is, is take these psychological theories and try to analyze some kind of marketplace behavior through those theories and then come up with a research question that I can ask to bring in to do a psychological study with. And with the results of those psychological studies, what I can then do is not only contribute back to the core discipline of psychology and have you know, an important theoretical development to, to that field, but also give back to, um, to you know, share the information with marketing practitioners so that, that this information is known in the marketplace and can be used um, in terms of overall marketing strategy as well. Okay, so a, a, a little bit more about the background as, as, as Debbie mentioned. Um, we do have a great facility here at Covey, the Consumer Perception and Cognition Laboratory. You can actually find us on Facebook. We try to um, uh, post information about recent studies that, that we've, we've conducted or new studies that we're currently collecting data for and if we're looking for participants. Um, one of the great things about this laboratory is that it is a great environment in which we can run behavioral experiments. So if we, wanna, if we have a hypothesis about something that can influence consumers' decisions, what we can do is operationalize those variables, randomly assign the participants into one of the conditions that we think could influence behavior. And because we're controlling for everything else, we're controlling for the kind of wine or, or whatever other contextual things, we're controlling for all of that, <coughs> 
we know that any results we find are a direct consequence of the variables that we've manipulated as opposed to some confounding uh, irrelevant factors. And so we know that the de dependent measures that we have are a direct result of what we've manipulated. So that's, that's the advantage of, of having a facility like this where we can do these kinds of controlled experiments. And this facility actually can be used for, for focus group research or it could be used for surveys or, or other um, research methods, um, but my research uses primarily experiments. And, and what's great also, Debbie mentioned, it's, it's right off campus, and so we do get not just people from the Brock community participating in these studies, but members of the Niagara community. So we have participants between um, you know, the legal drinking age up until 75, and so we can see, you know, we can generalize our results to, to a lot of uh, wide range of consumers. Okay, so going back to the framework, I'm first going to talk about little things that make a difference in this stage here. So, so again, you know, think about what are some of the little you know, incidental things that affect consumer choice that really shouldn't, right? I mean, presumably consumers should make a difference about the actual quality of the wine or what's inside the bottle, right? But there are, could be some other incidental things that make a difference, but shouldn't, okay? Oh. Phil, I've lost, oh, it's back. It's back on again, okay, we're good. Okay, so what I'd like you to do now is I'd like you to take a look at these labels here that I have on, and I'd like you to just think for a moment about which one of the two wines you would choose if you were in a store. This is the choice, the one on the left or the one on the right, okay? The one on the left or the one on the right? One of them was a label for a German wine. One of them was a label for a French wine. Imagine you're at the LCBO, the product consultant gives you these two wines, which one would you choose, okay? So, a study was done that I'm going to present right now. And by the way, all of the studies that I'm discussing today, not all of them are studies that I've run in the lab. Some of them are studies that other people have run. So regardless of the, of the source of the study, um, if you'd like to look up the original study, you can Google author the names at the bottom. Okay, so you can, you can keep that in mind as I go throughout the talk. So there's a, a study that was done, and what they did is they um, partnered up with a, a local wine shop, and what they wanted to see is whether the music that was being played in that retail context had an impact on the choices that consumers made. And all they did was run a simple experiment. One week they played German folk music, such as the sample clip that I just played. One week they played French music, then they played German music, and then they played French music. Okay, so over a, a series of weeks. And the question was, does, is, is there any influence on the choice that consumers make simply based on the music playing in the background? Should, shouldn't make a difference, right? People should probably buy the wine based on the wine, not on the music. And so what we look at is we could just simply look at the number of bottles of French wine sold versus the number of bottles of, of German wine sold. And what you can see here, it's very, very clear. What they found is that when French music was played, there was significantly more number of bottles of French wine sold as opposed to when German music was played but the inverse is true for the German wine, right? So there was so much more German, there were so many more bottles of German wine sold when German music was played as opposed to when French music was played. And so what this seems to suggest is that there's this, there could be this unconscious influence on people's behavior that the consumers themselves don't even recognize. And in fact, what's fascinating about this study is that they had an experimental confederate stand next to the cash register, okay? So as the consumers, or as the, you know, as the people made their purchase, right, 
and the Confederate recorded what was purchased. The Confederate said to the, to the consumer, oh, I'm just doing a survey today. Can you tell me what you've purchased? And so the person would say, oh, I just bought a bottle of this wine. And then the Confederate said, well, why? Well, was there any, anything particular about this wine? Or, and they said, I don't know. I just, I just bought wine. It's what I wanted. And so the, the attribution for the, the reason for the purchase had nothing to do with the music. This is something that is not even consciously recognized by consumers, but has a, can make a huge difference to, to what's actually purchased. So one day when I was at a wine shop, and it was actually when I was in Thailand, and so I had no idea about any of the kinds of wines that I was used to seeing, um, at the LCBO. And I, as a product consultant, I had a specific kind of wine in mind. I had a specific price point in mind. But the product consultant, you know, so she brought me the first one, first bottle to evaluate. Then she said, oh, you can also try this one, the second bottle to evaluate. And then she brought me the third. And she wasn't biased. She didn't she presented all of these three options as equally desirable options. So I started to wonder, does the order in which these options are presented to me matter in what I might choose? Because to me, they, at the time, not having any knowledge about these wines, they were all really the same. And so it, it led me to question whether the order in which I you know, evaluated these things, or consumers in general, could, could have a, an impact on what I end up buying, on the ultimate choice. And so what I did at this point is I actually went into the literature to look at these kinds of sequence-based effects on people's choices. And what you do, you know, when you look at that kind of literature, what you find is there's a whole bunch of data on things like voting for European song competition. So things like voting for American Idol or Canadian Idol, right? So if you think about, you know, there are 10 contestants, we're at the final 10 finalists, right? They should be performing in order. I'm sorry, in random order in the evening, right? You can't vote till the end of the show, right? So does the order in which these people perform make a difference, right? And what I found looking in this literature is what's called a recency effect, that judges, whether it's, you know, expert judges in skating competitions or in these music competitions, um, regardless of, of what the domain is, what, what's found in the literature is that people will evaluate, you know, the first, the second, the third, the fourth, and then the one most recent in memory, right, the one most recent to now, is the one that's most likely to be preferred or chosen or voted for. And, and actually, this was a classic study in the 70s where they brought in housewives who were presumably experts in evaluating stockings. And so they gave these women you know, the first pair of stockings, and they got to touch them, and then the second pair of stockings, and the third, and then the fourth. And then they said, OK, well, which pair of stockings was the best? Which was your favorite? And they tended to prefer the last, the fourth, the fourth one that was evaluated. And so this, you know, based on these results, you would think that, well, that means that as a consumer, the consumer would be most likely to choose the last wine in a set. If, if somebody is evaluating a set of wines, they would be most likely to choose the last. And so then at that point, I, you know, talking to people in, in sensory evaluation or in the sensory domain, they said, well, this actually doesn't make any sense from a sensory domain. Because if you think about the palette and, and sampling options, well, the first wine that's sampled is, is the strongest perceptually on the palette. And if you're sampling 10 wines, well, then all these other things kick in, right? And so from a sensory evaluation standpoint, that literature seems to suggest what we call a primacy effect, that the primary one should be the gold medal. The first one should have the advantage over subsequently sampled options. And so, and, and looking, going back way before the stocking studies, going back to the 50s, there are actually some classic studies looking at consumers um, 
in these uh, small panel um, tasting situations. And what, what, what's found is that if you give people you know, two wines to sample or three wines to sample, they always choose the first. And it was actually reported as a nuisance at the time that, oh, well, there's this annoying thing that happens that you should always keep in mind that the first one that a person samples is going to be chosen as a favorite anyway. So you should just put an extra filler wine first because if you're really interested if, as, as to whether they really like it or not, well, guess what? They're going to like it anyway, so just make sure you take that into consideration. And so, you know, thinking about this from a sensory evaluation standpoint, there's kind of two competing hypotheses in the literature. Do people prefer the first or do they prefer the last? And so that was a real question that, that, that needed to be answered and that um, is, is very informative in a number of different um, contexts. Does the serial position does the sequence in which options are evaluated matter in a consumer's final choice? So I mentioned those two competing hypotheses. Does anyone recognize a confound or a critical difference between the studies that found recency effects versus the studies that found primacy effects? Because there's one, one key difference. Okay. The one key difference. Consumption. Consumption. Well, you can actually. Okay, that's a good guess. But if we think about sensory evaluation being taste, touch, smell, sound, the Euro song competition, that's auditory evaluation. And then the stockings is, is, is a, you know, tactile. So that, it, good guess, but that's not the difference. Any other guesses? Because there's a, there's a critical confound between these two sets of studies. And that is that in the previous studies done on wine, they only ever tested samples of sequence lengths of two wines or three wines, right? They always found a primacy effect, right? Whereas in all the other studies that looks, looked at stockings or they looked at songs or they looked at um, skate, figure skating, there are always four, five, six, up till 12 options or many, many options. And so this really presented an interesting question as to, well, not only does the order in which options are sampled influence the final choice, but does the total number of options also matter, right? If you think about a winery experience for, for a consumer, you know, you go in with your friend, you might only sample two wines, and your friend might sample five, right? And so it really, it really could be a function of the number of options that are sampled. And so what we did in our, we just ran a very simple experiment. We brought participants into the lab. We randomly assigned participants to sample either two wines, three, four, or five wines. Okay, and we took, you know, and participants sort of expected that they were in a marketing study, that they were going to be given their, you know, feedback about the taste of, of wine, and you know, we told them you're going to be sampling, you know, a set of Pinot Noirs just here from the Niagara region, and all we're going to just ask you to do is sample them and then tell us at the end which one was your favorite. You know, kind of like in a winery, right? Where you come in and you say, well, which one of those was your favorite? Okay. The trick in this study, however, is that while participants thought they were tasting various um, wines of the same grape varietal, they were actually tasting the exact same wine. Okay? They just thought that they were different, but they were actually given identical 20 milliliter samples of the same wine. And just for generalizability purposes, um, you know, some participants sampled a set of Rieslings, some uh, sampled a set of Chardonnays, or what they thought was different Chardonnays, but they were actually the same Chardonnay. Um, we also used Cabernet Franc and Pinot Noir. And thank you to Andy Reynolds for, for um, sharing the student-produced wines from, from Covey to use in this study. Um, so, we, that's how, so that's how the study was done. And now here are the results. Now our critical dependent variable here is the probability with which people choose a particular wine based on the serial position. So how often do people choose the first? How often do people choose the second, third, and so on? 
Okay, and, and is that also dependent on the total number of wines in the sequence? And so here are the results. The first thing you can see here is that across all the sequence lengths, so no matter how many wines were sampled, people tended to prefer the first. Okay, you see that right there. That's our primacy effect. But as a sequence length gets longer to four or five options, now we start to see a recency pattern. Okay? And it's, what's uh, interesting about this is it's, it's not just this simple pattern that we can take away from this result. Um, because the question then is, well, did these people know anything about wine? Are these, you know, what kind of consumers were these? Were they all students? Were they experts? Did they, did they know anything? And, and actually, to, to just, um, I'm sure you're probably wondering, did anyone guess whether these were all the same? And the only person who guessed was a colleague of mine in marketing who came to participate in the study, and he knows that I'm a psychologist and I try to manipulate people this way. And so he was the only one out of all of the participants that we, that we examined who guessed that, who, who could tell and, and, and thought that they were all the same wines. So going back to this question of expertise, well, what we wanted to know, and, and the question that's asked is, well, who are, you know, are these people experts or are they low knowledge consumers? And so what we did is we um, gave participants an additional questionnaire and we, um, it's, a, it's a standard um, you know, measure of expertise where we can actually separate um, participants out into a high knowledge group versus a low knowledge group. And these are the kinds of questions that are asked. And, and typically, somebody who gets all of these questions correct, they know about wine. And people who don't, and, and they're just a, the casual consumer, they, they don't get these questions correct. Okay. So here are the data broken down by knowledge group. So the first thing you'll notice is that for both sets of participants, we still see the primacy effect. People are still likely, or more likely, to choose the first one sampled as the best. But for high knowledge consumers, especially for the longer sequence life lengths, especially with four options or five options, right? Now that's where we see the recency pattern emerge. And so just to, to explain why this is, um, and I'm sure that this, you, you probably have your own ideas about the difference between, you know, the cognitive mechanisms involved for the, you know, the low knowledge consumer versus the high knowledge consumer. Well, the person who knows a lot about wine, they're persistent and motivated and searching for the differences between the wines and whether something that's subsequently sampled, you know, the third is better than the second and so on, right? So by, give, by being motivated and persistent, you know, this consumer is looking for the better option. They're more open-minded and, and searching for uh, a subsequently sampled wine to beat a previously favored wine. And so by continually searching, it's this kind of consumer who would give themselves more of an opportunity to really like a subsequently sampled option, as opposed to the low knowledge consumer who, you know, samples the first one, they're kind of satisfied with it, it's, unless there's any reason for something later that, that they could even notice. They'll just kind of stick to the first. The first stands out, and, and that's what they'll choose. Okay, so taken together, um, you know, the takeaway from, from this study on, you know, one of the factors, one of the little things that influence consumer choice is that there's always an advantage for the first wine sampled, always. So whether it's a low-knowledge consumer or a high-knowledge consumer, we'll always see a primacy effect for the first. However... If it's a high knowledge consumer and they're persistent and they're motivated and, and you know they're going to be looking, well then save the best for, save the best for last. In, in, you know, from a sales standpoint, save the best for last because you know that there's already going to be a bias for the last because we know from this data that the high knowledge consumers are more likely to show this recency pattern as opposed to the low knowledge. Okay? All right. So now I want to talk about um, some of the little things that influence 
a consumer's experience of the taste of wine. Maybe how they describe it, how they rate the attributes or the characteristics of the wine. What are some of the incidental things? And you can probably think back to the beginning of the talk when we were discussing what some of these things are and, and have your own hypotheses about what you think would influence um, a person's experience of the taste of wine. Okay, So here's a classic study that was done. Um, when participants were given an identical white wine, okay, a glass of white wine, and in the experiment they either played upbeat, fast, energetic music, or they played Tchaikovsky. Well, what was found is that the participants in the study rated the wine or the characteristics of the wine using descriptive words more you know, similar or in line with the kind of music that was being played. So when Tchaikovsky was played, the wine was rated as more subtle and refined. Okay? And so what this seems to suggest is that the, you know, the taste and the experience of the wine can also be influenced by these incidental things um, similar to how they influence a consumer's um, initial choice. Okay. So here's another one. Um, now we all know uh, we all know that labels can have a huge influence on how a person might expect something to taste and ultimately how it does taste. Right? And so if I were to give you all a free glass of wine right now and I tell you, okay, this glass of wine is from California, or let, let's just say half of the class, half of the classroom, I give you a glass of wine, I say, okay, this is from a new winery in California, okay? Now the other half of the class, now you guys, let's say I give you the identical wine and I tell you it's from North Dakota, and if you're, you're familiar with North Dakota as a wine producing region, it's actually the last state to produce commercial wine and since, the prohib since prohibition. Um, and it actually had the last it, winery. I mean, it's the most uh, last state to, um, to um, open a winery. And so if I were to give you the exact same, I mean, what would you you'd probably expect that most consumers might rate the taste of the wine um, or, or any, any attributes about the wine differently if it had the label of, of California versus North Dakota, right? And this is something that's known and, and that was known prior to this study done in 2007. But what they actually did in this study was something a little bit different. What they did in this study is they wanted to see whether this simple label, right, the only thing that changes is the label for this wine, whether the simple label had any other kind of downstream consequences or spillover effects to something else, okay? So what they did is they partnered up with a restaurant. The restaurant had a set menu, okay? And what they did is they offered the patrons of the restaurant a free glass of wine that evening, okay? So half of the patrons of the restaurant were randomly assigned to receive a free glass of wine. And the, you know, the, the label was, this is a free glass of wine from a new winery in California. And the other half of the patrons in the restaurant and remember, fixed menu, so nothing else changed, nothing else varied. The other half of the patrons were assigned to get a free glass of wine from a new winery in North Dakota. Okay, same wine, same food, everything is the same. The only thing different that was manipulated in this experiment was the label. Okay, now what do you think differed? What do you think the outcome was of this study? Okay, because we already know, we already hypothesize that the taste of the wine might, per, because of a person's expectations, the actual taste might differ between these two experimental groups, but what else might differ? Well, the fascinating result about this study is that not only did people evaluate the taste of the wine differently, but there were actually consequences to the food. So the patrons in the restaurant who received the California label, they rated the food as being higher quality. They actually ate more food. 
So what they did in this experiment is when, they, when, the, when the people finished eating, they brought the plates back and they wanted to see which group had less food left on the plate. And actually the group that had the California label, they actually ate more food. Okay? Very surprising, right? This kind of spillover effect was very surprising that it could go so far. They also stayed in the restaurant longer because they actually timed how long the patrons stayed in the restaurant. And not only that, they were more likely, when asked, to make a return reservation than the group that got the label of North Dakota. And so this is something that's so simple and so little, but can have a huge impact on, on the restaurant's bottom line. Okay. Does anyone know what the field of neuroeconomics is? What's the field of the discipline of neuroeconomics. Anyone know? So we all know what economics is, right? So neuroeconomics, so what about neuroscience? What's neuroscience? The study of what? The brain. It's the study of the brain, right. So the field of neuroeconomics, and this is, this is, uh, this is relatively new. Um, there aren't a lot of published studies on this, um, but the, the results of the study that I'm, I'm about to describe are, are very, very interesting. So I'm talking now again about little things that make a difference to the experience of the taste of a wine, okay? And we talked about labels, we talked about music, but with neuroeconomics, so this is a field where what we can look at is neural activity in the brain Okay, when people are making a decision, okay, neural activity, because we know we know from neurobiology that there are certain areas of the brain involved in memory or attention, and we also know that the medial orbital frontal cortex is involved with the experience of pleasure, right? It's the, we have more blood flow, more blood, you know, the, the level of, of the blood uh, oxygen activity level in the medial, medial orbital frontal cortex is, is, you know, high when people are sensing very, a lot of pleasure. We know that from, from, from neuro, neuroscience. And so what this group of researchers did is they asked the question of whether a wine's price because we know, we know that there's this price quality inference consumers make, right? We know that if something is 30, if a bottle of wine is $39 versus $12, and there's nothing else that the consumer knows about the wine other than the price, right? They will, they will probably infer the quality of the wine based on that cue because that's the only available cue they'll have to use, right? And we think back to, to a wine list, right? And so, you know, for the average consumer who maybe doesn't recognize the, the names of, of the vineyards or the, the brand names of the wine, what they'll look at is the price column, right? That's just the, the only available information they might have, right? And so this question was actually asked in this study. And what they wanted to see, what the researchers wanted to see was if we get people, and, and this is a really interesting study in how they did this, because you can imagine all of the resources that are needed to carry out a study like this, and we, we don't have this in our lab. Uh, maybe one day we will, but we don't. So you get participants to come into the lab, you hook them up to the scanner that measures the, the uh, you know, brain, blood flow in the brain. You give, you know, there's a computer screen in there. They are, you know, able to make some basic behavioral responses. Yes is your left hand and, and no is your right hand and so on. And what they did is they had these straws, you know, shooting a sip of wine into, into their participants' mouths as they were answering the questions about the taste of the wine. And all they did, it's, it's so simple, is they, they, you know, shot a sip of, of a wine and they said, you know, this is the this $12 or low price point. And then they shot a sip of the same wine again with a higher price. And guess what they found? They found that there was more, if we think about the area of the brain involved with pleasure 
there was more activity in that area of the brain associated with sipping wine that they, the participants thought was a higher priced wine. That means the utility derived, the, the, the experienced utility actually from a neurophysiological standpoint changes drastically if the consumer expects the wine to be a higher price. And this is such a simple illustration of how the taste of the experience of the wine can somehow sometimes extend far beyond what's actually in the wine, right? But rather the things associated with that wine, the marketing messages, right? The price or promotion or whatever other marketing messages associated with that wine, okay? So going back to, to looking at these, these, these factors that are sort of incidental to the experience of the taste of the wine, I was... Um, I was at, you know, I always do the, the, I always get the discovery pass during the wine festival and I always go around to all the wineries and see what, what's going on and what's new and exciting. And one day when I was at a winery during the wine festival a couple years ago, and I went with a, with a, uh, with a partner and I remember we, um, it was like a little game that they were playing. So you, you sample the first Chardonnay, and then you answer these little questions, and then your partner does the same with maybe the same wine or a different wine, and you kind of see um, you know, your responses, and then you see ultimately how you evaluate this wine and so on. And I remember at that time, I was looking at the questions that were asked, and I mean, I guess at the time I didn't know, I didn't know the, the winery owner or anything. I didn't ask, they were really busy, but I kind of wondered whether the format of the questions or, or the way in which the question was asked might influence me. So I was you know, thinking like a psychologist. And so I, you know, I started to wonder whether, you know, if you ask a question to someone and then that person responds to, to your question, does the way in which the question asked or even the response format influence how that person experiences the thing that they're answering the question about. In this case, it was wine, right? Does, does the fact that they're asking me this little questionnaire change my interpretation of the taste of this wine? Because if it does, wow, that's such a simple thing that, that can be done at a winery. And also, it's such a simple thing that the winery owners are doing that they don't have any clue as to you know, what the consequences are, right? So that was the question here, and that's something that we've been investigating in the lab and I'll tell you what this reminded me of this is a classic study done there was a classic study that was done in psychology that that looked at at this kind of question that that asked whether the something as simple as the numerical values on a rating scale could influence a person's perception of something and later on their overall evaluation of something or their remembered experience of something. So let me just ask you, now this, this study was done in the 90s. And so what they did is they asked about a public figure. So, so Prime Minister Tony Blair, okay? So let me just, you know, just think about for a moment, how intelligent is Tony Blair? Just think about that for a moment. Now let's say that this side of the classroom I randomly assign you to answer that question, how intelligent is Tony Blair, on a numerical scale like this. Okay, so you answer the question on a 0 to 10 scale. Whereas for the people on this side of the room, let's say I ask you that exact same question, I give you the same number of points, except the numerical values I give you are minus 5 to plus 5. Something very simple, arbitrary. Well, what they found in this study that is, is a little bit counterintuitive is that when, when you think about the person's interpretation of these numerical values on the scale, well, the people in the unipolar group, okay, the people who are evaluating um, these attributes or the, this characteristic of Tony Blair from a 0 to 10 scale, well, they'll interpret this question in a certain way where a 0 in this case indicates the absence of the trait in question, right? On the other hand, 
the people who were asked to evaluate on this kind of scale, well, a zero means to something totally different, right? A zero could, could be interpreted as sort of the, this midpoint between, you know, this side of the scale refers to intelligence, and, and now I can interpret that the researcher is pointing me to kind of think that, okay, this side of the scale is the opposite of whatever the trait is that's being asked about. In this case, it would be the, you know, the opposite of intelligence, right? And so this psychological interpretation of the question wording, well, does it have any kind of downstream consequences? And what they found in this study that's, that's really um, surprising is that not only did this group tend to focus their initial responses on this end of the scale, because that's what the question asked, right? Not only did they focus on this end of the scale, but later on, so if you ask people five minutes later, okay, overall, how do you rate Tony Blair? So overall, how, was, you know, how would you describe him? How would you rate him? And let's say that now we gave a, a blank, you know, uh, scale with no numbers on it and you just say, you just sort of mark on that line how, what your overall evaluation is of Tony Blair. Well, somehow this group of participants had a higher overall evaluation about Tony Blair than, than this group. And so this suggests that the simple numerical values on a rating scale can have a huge impact on how somebody will remember what it is they're, they're, they're evaluating. And so going back to sensory evaluation for a moment and thinking about things from a sensory evaluation standpoint, you know, the question is, can this apply, right? Can this apply to, to, to you know, tastes and, and experiences in, in that domain? And so if we think about you know, sensory science for a moment as, as a discipline, um, sensory science assumes that consumers are, are rational decision makers, that they're going to um, make, you know, sensory evaluation should not be as biased as higher order cognitive or, or you know, uh, judgments that are more you know, social cognitive, for example. Um, and so these kinds of things, these kinds of contextual question wording, numerical values on a, a rating scale sh probably shouldn't affect a person's taste of the experience of the wine. And, you know, thinking about sensory science, um, our sensory systems have been optimized by evolution, right? And so it's, it's claimed that sensory inputs or things that we use to interpret uh, a sensory experience are, you know, what we call inherently evaluable. Now, what that means is that throughout evolution, humans have an inherent ability to judge whether something is good or bad. If something's too bitter or, or too sweet, the, you know, it's just they know what's good or bad. It's not something that needs to be socialized. It's something that we've evolved to know the difference between good and bad. So that's what I mean when I say inherently evaluable. Now, on the other hand, something could be inherently inevaluable, like the size of a diamond ring, for example, if it's one carat or two carats. Well, that, whether that's good or bad depends on society, depends on if you've been married before, you know, depends on a number of different contextual factors that people take, use as inputs in evaluating whether it's good or bad. So, so going back to sensory evaluation, these kinds of things really should not matter. And so the question then becomes, well, when you ask somebody about these inherently evaluable things, when you ask somebody, how does this taste, right? You have to know how to ask them. And so then you go to, you know, if you look at, um, um, at least the research that I've done that looks at the sort of textbook definitions of proper research methods um, to use in sensory evaluation, um, it seems that the number of scale points is very important, right? And so we, we learn about that in these research methods courses, um, the extremity of, of the labels. But what's often overlooked are these little things like the numerical values, right? And so if we were to look at these kinds of things and, and having an impact on the person's experience of the taste of the wine, and let's say they do have an impact, well, this is, this is something that 
is maybe being used and nobody knows that it's having an impact on the consumer's final decision or their final report of the experience of the taste of the wine. So this is the research question that I'm going to talk about now is can the, the, the way in which you ask a question about the experience of the taste in wine, for example, like with rating scales, can that influence a consumer's retrospective evaluations of, of how they evaluate the taste of the wine. And that's something that we've been looking at in the lab recently because this is something that nobody's looked at with taste before. So we ran a very simple experiment. Um, we brought participants into the lab. We gave them a glass of white wine. Okay? And we had the participants sample the wine, you know, take a sip, think about it, answer some questions. And they rated the wine on four attributes, okay? Freshness, complexity, fruitiness, and crispness. And just like the study I just described, we randomly assigned participants to rate those attributes on either a unipolar scale ranging from zero to 10 or on a bipolar scale ranging from minus five to plus five. Okay, so based on the results of, of the study I just described, we would think that because of the person's interpretation of what the researcher is asking or their own intuitive theories about what a zero means and where they should focus and how they want to answer the question, we would expect that the people in the bipolar group, right, because these are positive attributes, right, the people in the bipolar scale would probably stick to this side of the scale, right? But now the question is, does the way in which they answer this really simple question about these attributes have any kind of downstream consequences to how much they evaluate the wine, maybe even how much they're willing to pay for the wine? And so that's what we did is we just waited a couple minutes, so they sampled it, and then they were kind of you know, waiting in the lab, and then we gave them a couple questions. One of the questions was, well, overall, how much do you like? You know, this is a question you could ask, right? Oh, you just sampled one. How, how did you like it, right? And we gave them an 11-point num numberless scale for which they could just put, you know, mark off where, where their response lies. And we also asked them, okay, well, how much would you be willing to pay for a bottle of the wine you just sampled? And this question is actually quite interesting because when you give people an open-ended how much are you willing to pay, they could say zero, they could say a hundred, they could say anything, right? So if they really didn't like it, they, they really had the option, they're not bounded by anything, they could actually just say, you know what, I zero, right? And so what I'm gonna show you is the result of these, these two questions for the bipolar group versus the unipolar group. Okay. And as I, I said earlier, the prediction we made is that the group that earlier or you know, a few minutes ago just evaluated these attributes on a bipolar scale would have more positive evaluations as evidenced in the overall evaluation measure and in the willingness to pay measure as opposed to the unipolar group. Okay, that's what we predicted. And actually, that's what we found. So here on the left, this is the data for the question that we asked. Overall, how much do you uh, like this wine? And we gave them an 11-point numberless scale, so I just added the numbers here for you for ease of comprehension. And what you can see is that the group that earlier evaluated those four attributes of the wine on the bipolar scale they had significantly higher ratings of the wine than the group that earlier evaluated that wine using a unipolar scale, okay? Now, what happens with willingness to pay? Again, this is just an open-ended question. Well, what we found is that the group that earlier evaluated those, those four attributes on the bipolar scale, well, they're, they're willing to pay $17.51 on average. Whereas the group that was asked the exact same thing, except they're, they're making their responses on the zero to 10 scale and the unipolar scale, well, their average willingness to pay is $15.05 Canadian. And so this is just such a simple 
simple thing about the question wording and the format of the questions and the numerical values on the scale for which the consumers are asked to respond that could have huge downstream consequences on their um, you know, remembered evaluation of the wine and how much they would say that they would be willing to pay for the wine. And so our explanation of this is that for, you know, for most consumers, when they're tasting a wine, the actual memory of the experience of the taste of the wine is very fleeting, right? It's not something that's easily described. It's not something that's easily remembered. And so if the experience of the taste is just something that's fleeting, and then a moment later you ask the person, well, how much you know, do you like this wine, or how, would you like to buy it, or, or these kinds of questions, well, what that consumer will do is they'll use any inputs that they have into answering that question. So if, if the only input they have in that moment that's salient in their minds is that when they answered this question, it was kind of up there on the scale. Because they probably won't remember what number they circled or, or, or what, even what the question was and what they were asked, because they're not in a memory test here. They're just, they're just answering the current question. And so if the only thing they have, or one of the main things they have as an input into that current judgment is that, well, a moment ago, I just, I remember it was, you know, my response was kind of up there, then they'll use that as an input into this current decision, okay? And so in that sense, this, this experience of the taste of the wine can be influenced by these simple things like the numerical values on the scale, and that these responses on these questions can later be used as inputs into subsequent decisions and subsequent judge it, judgments that the consumer may make, okay? Such as how much they're willing to pay. Okay, so just in the last five minutes or so, um, I'm just gonna wrap up and talk about um, my favorite part of the framework, which is understanding the incidental things that influence the memory of the experience of either the, the behavioral choice that was made or the experience of the taste of the wine. Now, I already mentioned that um, when consumers are making uh, a decision about which wine to buy that they may use as inputs previous evaluations. Um, so in addition to that, there are a couple more that I'd just like to quickly mention. And I, I'm not going to get into too many details about these studies, but um, they're going to be a subject, I guess, for, for future talks. So a couple of the questions that we're, we're looking at right now in the lab is that one of the questions is, can connecting with a person's autobiographical memory. So if you, if you connect with a person's identity, their own experiences from their own past, so it's really you know, individualized where, where you know, as, a, as a salesperson or even through marketing messages, so advertising messages, you know, we see nostalgia marketing a lot in the marketplace. So connecting to a person's own autobiographical memory, does that have consequences for a person's consumption patterns. And I'd be happy to, to go over this study in a little bit more detail if anyone would like to um, talk to me at another point. Um, but that's the kind of question that we're, we're answering right now in the lab. In addition, one of the uh, studies that I'm running with colleagues in psychology is looking at the kinds of appeals that, that, that are made either through advertising messages or, or through sales messages, and how these kinds of appeals influence a, cons a person's consumption patterns, right? And so what we know about a lot, you know, there's a whole literature in marketing on utilitarian appeals versus hedonic appeals, right? That, you know, so if you think about it from a wine, you know, wine standpoint, utilitarian would be, you know, this wine matches good with this meal. It's just useful, they go well together, or the wine is good for you, right? It's just a benefit to, to you. It's not anything above and beyond that. That's utilitarian. But then hedonic is this, you know, well, this is a pleasurable, aromatic, great experience that is, is you know, if you're high on, you know, sen sensation seeking as a sort of personality variable that you're kind of interested in that hedonic experience of that taste of the wine, independent of, of the benefits of the wine. You just want to taste and get that good, pleasurable feeling associated with that wine, right? 
So that's utilitarian and hedonic, and you can understand and, and see the kinds of sales messages that, or marketing messages and marketing activities that could be used in one of those frames. Well, what hasn't been studied that we're actually looking at is what's called a deservingness appeal, right? And we see this in the marketplace. We see, um, you know, you deserve a break today, all these taglines, because you're worth it, right? There are all these taglines that look at, well, you deserve to, you know, to, to indulge, right? Because it's something about you, right? So connecting to a person's identity and what you think that they deserve as a consumer because they've worked hard and they have high self-esteem and because they maybe believe in a just world or they, they believe that, you know, I've worked hard, right, and I deserve this, then, you know, does that kind of message um, change consumption patterns above and beyond the traditional hedonic versus utilitarian. And so that's something that we're looking at in the lab right now. We've actually just finished data collection, and so I'll be, um, I'll be happy to answer questions about that at a later point. So just to wrap up for today, I've gone over a number of little incidental things that can make a huge difference to a consumer's experience in the behavioral, during the behavioral choice phase of the consumer's decision-making process to the consumer's uh, experience of the taste of the wine um, and ultimately to the consumer's memory of the experience of the taste of the wine or the initial choice. And so what I'd like, to, what I'd like you all to take away from this talk today is that you know, if we think about the, all the steps in the value chain, right? So we have the grape growing and the wine making all the way down, all the way down, you know, the, the, the value chain to the ultimate consumer, right? There are so many variables that, that you all know that could influence um, the grapes or that could influence all these different stages. But what's often overlooked, or, or not so much overlooked, but just not really taken into consideration because the knowledge, because we don't know the answers, right? We don't know all the answers to what influences consumers. And that's why there is value added to doing these kinds of behavioral studies to see what are the little incidental things that can influence a consumer's decision making process, which can ultimately have a huge impact on your bottom line. So I hope that's what you've all taken away today from my study. Thank you all to everybody who, um, who contributed to this research. Thank you all for being here today and thanks to everybody watching online. And I would be happy at this point to take any questions you have about any of this research. How did you choose the order of wines tasted? And, how, and do you feel the order, sweetness, body of wine may have also had an effect? Okay, so so can we do the first? Let's do. Let me repeat the first question first. So what is? So can you actually repeat it? The first how, question. How did you choose the order of wines tasted? How did I choose the order of wines tasted? Well, that question. So we actually presented the same wine. So we wanted to see whether order had an effect on the person's ultimate choice, but to make sure that that question was answered properly and that it's not a function of, of something else, we actually just presented the same wine. Um, so participants thought that they were different Chardonnays, for example, but they were actually the same Chardonnay in sequence position one, in position two, position three, and so on. So that's and, and I think, so the second question, and that leads into the second question. So can you just repeat because I... And do you I just, feel the order, sweetness, body of wine uh, may have also had an effect? Um, so is that assuming that the wines are all the same or that they're all different? Because presumably when you go into a tasting room, you, you taste wines in a particular order based on the, on the sweetness levels, right? And so we know that that should probably influence um, consumers. So we wanted to hold that all constant. So we wanted to make sure that the results that we found, right, that the primacy or recency effects that we found were not a function of the particular kind of wine in a particular serial position. We wanted to make sure that the result we found was a function of the actual serial position. Okay? Is there a follow-up question? <laughs> 
Okay. Are there any other questions? Yes, at the back? Um, well, the two things to that. So they were asked to choose their favorite, but the researcher also asked them at the end <clears throat> what they thought the hypothesis of the study was, so that they did have an opportunity to 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 let the researcher know that you know what I chose the fifth, but I actually thought that they were all the same. And as I said, that in the situ in the case where uh, the a participant did guess the hypothesis of the study, we actually eliminated that person's data from, from our results. Because as I'm sure the reason you're asking the question is that that might bias the results, right? So, so yes. Okay. Any other questions? Yes, Kate. Oh, so in the serial position effects study? Well, what I would suggest, and because we didn't actually do that version of the study, and we certainly can in the future, um, but what I would suggest is that um, one of the simplest tools to use is to try um, and decide, first of all, what kind of consumer is this? I mean, if they're asking the product consultant, they probably don't know a lot about, about wine. So the assumption can be made maybe that they're low, relatively on the low knowledge end of the, of the scale. And so having said that, um, they'll probably be biased to pick the first. And so I would present the one that, that you would like to showcase first. Um, because that's probably the, the rule or, you know, the, they'll probably satisfy. So they'll just they'll look at the first and it's good enough unless there's something else that you're pre going to present to me later on in the sequence that beats it for some reason. I'll stick to the first. Okay, that's a good question. Yes, Patty. Okay, so the, that's a really good question. The question is, when the participants were sampling the wine, were they able to go back to something that was previously sampled? And actually, no, we, because we wanted to control everything um, as much as possible, we, we basically instructed them, you know, here's the first one, taste it. Here's the second one, taste it. And, we, and not, nobody went back. They just kind of followed the instructions. But that's a really good question that we should look at in future research because obviously in, in other contexts, if all of the wines are presented simultaneously and, and consumers do have that opportunity, that, that might change um, the, the strategy that they use. Um, and so that's a, that's a really important question. So thank you. Yes? I think building on that question was just asked why I was curious as to whether price was taken into consideration on that sequence. That's another good question. So again, we, we tried to keep the only variables we manipulated was the serial position. Was it position one, two, three, four, or five? And the, to, you know, the total number of options. So we had to keep that, that consistent. But certainly, these are all variables that we think could potentially moderate the results that we found. Are there any other questions? Yes. Yes. Have you looked at uh, the service of food with wine in wine and beer? F so you know, that, that's serving food plus an increase in sales. So is the question then if if there's winery X and winery Y, winery X also has a, a restaurant establishment as part of it? So Does that influence? Oh, I see. Okay, does the... That's an interesting question. So does, so if you give the identical wine, but ran, you randomly assign some participants to get some kind of food option versus no food option. 
I, I, I don't know if anyone's actually run that particular study, but I would imagine that it would be a similar result to what the uh, California, North Dakota study showed, that there's going to be this kind of spillover effect to the wine because of these other things that people might associate with the quality of the wine, and they may even interpret the quality as, as better or higher. It could be. But that's a really, uh, that's a really good question that I'm not sure... Uh, With wine. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, there's certainly a lot of literature in marketing that, that looks at um, sampling and, and giving uh, consumers an opportunity to form an evaluation in that sense um, in, in sort of non-wine related studies. So, so definitely hypotheses could be derived from those studies. Are there any other questions at this point? Please join me in thanking uh, Antonia for Thank a, you. a wonderful afternoon. Thank you. Um, oh. We have just a small token of oh. our appreciation for Thank your you. time and, and sharing your expertise with us. Thank afternoon. you. Thanks a lot. Thank you all for being here.